Welcome again, everyone. I'm Robert Breaker, and this week's sermon is, well, there's the title. What do you, what do you think about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought about maybe getting a different title, but I thought, well, no, this, this is a good title. But I am aware and do understand how some people might say, well, that sounds a little bit like clickbait, Robert Breaker, with a title like that. Yeah, yeah, if you don't know what clickbait is, it's, it's a title that makes you go, ooh, i got to click on that because I want to hear what that's all about. So hopefully this will meet your expectations of the title. We're going to look at today the Antichrist. And I want to talk about how the Antichrist has a split personality. And by that, I mean that the Antichrist is actually two people in one, which is quite interesting. So I want to show that to you. I want you to see that. And I believe, personally, that the Antichrist is alive and well today. And that when the rapture comes, as soon as it comes, he's taking over. But I believe he lives, and he is in the world somewhere today. Now, who is he? I don't know. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, I might be having a live stream with a guest who will uh, shed some light on that. And uh, so pray for that and look for that hopefully in the next couple of weeks. But let's go to uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18 to begin our study today. 1 John 2, 18. We're going to look at the Antichrist, some of what the Antichrist is, what the Bible says about him. How would you recognize someone like that? Does the Bible give any distinguishable features of him that we might know who he might be? Well, when I say we, uh, I don't mean me. I plan on getting out at the rapture. But the Bible does make it look like that we can know who he is before the rapture. And we might just see him, but as soon as we know he's the Antichrist, then we go out immediately at the rapture. So I'm going to show you all these verses today. I'm literally going to go to as much scripture as I can. So I hope you have your Bible handy. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. The Apostle John says these words, Little children, it is the last time. (laughs) Now some people, they kind of make fun of the Bible, say, oh, he wrote that 2,000 years ago. How can it be the last time? Well, I've showed you before that a day with the Lord is a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is in one day, so four days or 4,000 years of history, Jesus shows up. So you only have 3,000 years left, or three days, because there was six days of creation, and on the seventh day God rested. Well, that seventh day would correspond with the 7,000 years of history or the last 1,000 years, which is the millennium. So it looks like, yeah, we're in the last, if you look at all of creation as a week, of uh, God's creation calendar week, we're toward the end of that, toward the last three days. So there's nothing wrong with him saying that we are in the last time. They really believed they were back then. If you remember the prophecies of Daniel, it could have been had the Jews accepted their Messiah. So... There's nothing wrong with him saying, little children, it is the last time. But this is also a prophecy for us today who are way later in the last time. And look what it says. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, all right, this is the Antichrist, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So the Bible talks about the Antichrist, who is a literal man, who will rule for seven years in the tribulation period over the whole world. So there's the Antichrist. But there's also Antichrists, plural. And they've existed from the time of John and the Apostles to today. So there's Antichrists, there's the Antichrist, and then the Bible talks about the spirit of Antichrist. So you got kind of three, almost like a satanic trinity there or something. The Antichrist, many Antichrists, and the spirit of Antichrist. Now let's go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. When I see what's happening in the world today, you know what I think, knowing my Bible? I think, boy, it's the spirit of Antichrist. Because everything we see taking place in the world is all to help the kingdom of the Antichrist come into existence. And I personally see it. I don't know if you can, but I can see it because I read my Bible. How all the different governments of all the different countries around the world are working with the UN to help bring in a global one world government. There's a term called the global reset. And I believe that's part of their plan. To reset the world in such a way that one man comes on the scene and that one man will rule the world. Who would that one man be? Well, if you believe your Bible, it's the prophesied Antichrist. And that's what we see in the Bible. But 
this Antichrist fella, he kind of has a split personality, <laughs> according to the Bible. So let's look at that today. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that would be the coming at the rapture. Now I hope you know your Bible. Uh, a lot of people today are changing what the Bible teaches, and that's a shame. But you need to read your Bible and know what it teaches, because the Bible teaches that this is the church age, and that the church age is the time for God to save both Jew and Gentile, and then he takes them out at the rapture of the church. Then this little period of time here, after the rapture, is the time known as the tribulation. And this tribulation time period is a time in which the Antichrist is going to rule. And then Jesus will return at the battle of Armageddon. And then Jesus will set up a millennial kingdom where Jesus will reign for a thousand years. That's what the word millennium means. And this all takes place at the battle of Armageddon. So a lot of people today are saying, no, no, there's not two comings of Jesus. There's only one coming of Jesus. So they think it's all leading up to Armageddon, and we who are saints today of the church, we're all going to go through the tribulation, and then Jesus is going to come back and tell us, good job. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The first time Jesus came, there were two comings of Christ. He came, and he was born, so we have the birth of Jesus. And then he died, was buried, and rose again. Then when he rose again, he came back down for a short time on this earth. And then, Acts chapter 1, read it if you'd like, then he went up to heaven again. So there's two parts to the first coming, or the first advent of Jesus, just as there will be two parts to the second coming, or the second advent of Jesus. First the rapture, then seven years of tribulation, then Armageddon, when the Antichrist is defeated. So, here we read in... 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, rapture, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is the rapture. Shame on new versions of the Bible for changing that to day of the Lord. The day of the Lord has to do more with Armageddon. But it says, For the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now that falling away is what we call apostasy. Apostasy literally means a falling away from a standing position. In other words, uh, much of those who claim to be Christians falling away from sound doctrine, and they're beginning to teach false doctrine. Except there be a falling away first, and here he mentions the Antichrist, and it's almost like he's got a split personality, because he mentions two different things about him. Gives him two different names, if you will. And that man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of perdition. So the Antichrist has two names. So when we look at the Antichrist in the Bible, the Antichrist, he's got two names. Now why would the Antichrist have two different names? Is he a split personality? Is he a schizophrenic, if you will? <laughs> The Antichrist is called the man of sin, and he's called the son of perdition. So he's given two distinctly different names. Why is that? By the way, who is the son of perdition? Well, that reminds me of Judas back in the Gospels, but we don't have time to go there today. But Paul says, Let no man deceive you, verse 3, by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. So the rapture can't come until something takes place, that's apostasy, until the world falls into apostasy and turns away or falls away from the teachings of the Bible, and then there's a revelation of someone. And who is the revelation of? It's the revelation of the man of sin. Comma, who is also called, a different name, the son of perdition. So he's given two completely different names. Why is that? Well, I believe because he begins as the man of sin, and then he becomes the son of perdition later. So that's another proof of a pre-tribulation rapture. Because he comes on the scene as the man of sin, something takes place, 
then he becomes the son of perdition. And I hope we'll get into that today and look at all that. But look what he says here in verse 3. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now who is this sitting in the temple of God saying he's God? It's not the man of sin, it's the son of perdition. you got to remember that. Now verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica, and he's saying, Hey, remember when I was there, I talked about all this, I told you everything like this? When I'm reading this, I'm like, no, Paul, I don't remember. <laughs> that was almost 2,000 years ago. I wasn't there. All I have is the Bible. I wonder what other details Paul might have told them that we don't have in the Bible. Hmm, I wonder if... He might have said other things, too. Or if we have everything that he says in the Bible in his other books. That's a good question. But he talked about this, and he prophesied of what would happen in these last times at the rapture and after. And he gives the Antichrist two distinctly different names. And it's an interesting thing, because I'm a firm believer in a seven-year tribulation. So I believe that the tribulation period is seven years total. Now, a lot of guys today, I guess you could say they're an apostasy. They've fallen away from that belief because that used to be the standard belief of the church for many, many, many years. Now, people say, all the way back to Darby, and that's all. No, no, there's way farther back, 100, 200, 300 years after Jesus. You can find pre-tribulation Bible believers. And a good book on that is by a man named Ken Johnson, where he talks about a pre-tribulation rapture, and he quotes some of these early uh, believers, 100, 200, 300 years after Jesus, and how they believed rapture, then the Antichrist. So rapture first, then seven years of tribulation. So the Bible talks about all this. Now let's go ahead and just for fun, read the rest of chapter 2. Like I said, I want to read a lot of scripture today because it shines light on who this fellow is who is the Antichrist. Verse 6, And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. So who's going to be revealed in his time? Is it the man of sin, or is it the son of perdition? Well, one of those two is going to be revealed in his time. Maybe both of them are revealed in their time. But over there in, in verse 3, it talks about someone is going to be revealed who is the man of sin. So there's a revelation of the man of sin, and there's a revelation of the son of perdition. And it looks like the man of sin is revealed to the world, my thought is, as the leader of the United Nations. And when he is elected, Christians will say, I bet that's the Antichrist. And then, boop, 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 trumpet blows, rapture, we're out of here, and he gets his seven years. By the way, somebody told me that the United Nations is, is trying to get a vote to where the president can serve a seven-year term. Boy, that would be awful convenient, wouldn't it? Just so you match the Bible. <laughs> you can't get away from the Bible, folks. It's always going to match up with what the Bible says. But it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Who is that? Who's taken out of the way there? Is it the man of sin taken out of the way and then the son of perdition is revealed? Or is it some people say that's the Holy Spirit be taken out of the way. Then the rapture. It's hard to figure out some of these passages. You have to read it over and over. But it says in verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That wicked. Notice that's a capital W. And look what it says. The Lord will come at the brightness of his coming. That's at Armageddon when the Lord comes. And the Lord will destroy at Armageddon, the son of perdition. So here's how I do it, and I'm going to show you a lot of verses that will line up with this. But I believe that the man of sin is this fella who takes over as the Antichrist, and he is allowed to take over for three and a half years. Three and a half years is also 42 months and is also 1,260 days. We're going to read here in a minute in the book of Revelation that during this man's reign, after three and a half years, something takes place to him, and that's where he's killed. And then he rises again from the dead, and now he's the son of perdition. Alright, so he's the son of perdition. So the son of perdition. 
And he rules for the final three and a half years, or 42 months, or 1,260 days. If you take seven and divide it in two, that's 3.5, so three and a half. So the tribulation period that the Bible describes that takes place after the rapture, in the time which the Antichrist is on the earth ruling, is a seven-year period, and it's split, like a split personality, where this Antichrist is three and a half years known as the man of sin, and the last three and a half years, he's the son of perdition. And he's called that Wicked One, capital W, that Wicked. So I see the Antichrist as a literal man here, but I see him over here as the devil incarnate in that man. Now I've got all these scriptures to go to to show you this, but I'm just showing up here real quick so that as we read them, you'll be able to see it and visualize what we're talking about. But let's look at this. Verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That would be the son of perdition. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. The devil is a liar. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Verse 11, And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There will be a gigantic lie in the last days that all the world swallows. A lie that they will all believe that is an outright lie. I wonder what that could be. Hmm. And it says here in verse 13, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. So we're saved from having to go through this time of the tribulation. Thank God it's not just salvation of our soul. The Bible says God did not appointed us to wrath. And it's during this time that God's wrath is poured out upon the earth. So I believe in a pre-trib rapture. But it says, through belief of the truth. Salvation is through faith, through belief. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, that saves us. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Verse 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So there's a comfort to us. If you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it talks about the rapture. It says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. If we were going through the tribulation, that wouldn't be a comfort, would it? So the Bible teaches, I believe, a pre-tribulation rapture. Now this passage here, a lot of it talks about the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is mentioned a lot in Scripture. Is he a nice fellow? Well, the world's going to worship him. So I think the Antichrist is going to come on the scene and say, Hey, look at me, I'm nice. And he's going to get people to accept how nice he is. Is he going to be a lovable character? Will the world say, man, we like this guy? Well, probably. Let's go look at some verses about him, and let's go to Daniel chapter 11. But this is not who he is. So it's like, hmm, I wonder if he has a split personality. Because the Bible calls him wicked, but yet he is worshipped. Would you worship someone for their wickedness, or would you worship someone for their goodness? So he's going to try to portray himself, probably, as a nice good person. And I can see that. And I can see that's why the world loves him. Daniel chapter 11. Let's look at Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 21. Speaking about the Antichrist here. Daniel eleven twenty one. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flattery. So this guy tries to portray that he's peaceable. And he tries to portray that he's nice. Now let me show you why I say he tries to portray that he's nice. He shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Just for fun, I looked up the word flattery, and it means excessive and insincere praise, especially given to further one's own interest. So he goes around telling everyone how great they are, and puffing them full of pride so much that they're like, yeah, I like him because he's nice to me. Look at those flatteries that he gives. Why, well, he's flattering me. Weird. Well, go to verse, um, oh, verse 24. Verse 24 says, He shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province, 
And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his fathers' fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Isn't that interesting? So he's flattering people and he's using devices. You know what this little thing is? It's called an iPhone. It's a device. Hmm. Does that have anything to do with what he's saying there? Well, I'll let you decide. But it's interesting that he's using all this. And look at verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So as he comes, he's trying to be nice and he's claims to be peaceable, and he's flattering everyone. People are swooning. Oh, he's here. They're worshiping and adoring the man. But the people that know God say, no, all I see is wickedness. He's supposed to be nice, but I don't see that niceness. I see him as mean. So you see, a true believer in Christ can see through someone like this, because we look at the Bible. But a lost person can't. Now, we leave, but I'm saying, do we see him before? I'm seeing a lot in this world, and a lot of the uppity-ups and the higher-up people in the world trying to come across as nice and, and flattering, and, but really, I see who they are. They're corrupt, and they're evil, so I don't want to follow them. Um, let's go to Revelation chapter 13. So, he comes across as a nice guy. Everybody thinks he's so nice and so great. So when the Antichrist comes, a lot of people in the world will love him and worship him and follow him and think he's the greatest thing since sugar molasses. But is he that great? He's just putting on a show of what he is trying to present that he is. But if you saw what he really was on the inside, you'd be like, no, that's evil incarnate. That's a man of sin. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Revelation 13, 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And a dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. What's the dragon in the Bible? Satan. So this guy gets his power from Satan. So he's really a Satanist. But then look what happens. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, this is the Antichrist, and he's killed. I think that's in the middle of the tribulation. And I look at verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast. They worshipped the dragon. They're worshipping Satan. Do you realize there's a lot of people out there that are Luciferian and Satanists? The Bible says that they're going to be more of those in the last days than Christians. I hate to say that, but that's what it's saying, because after the rapture, most of the people in the world are worshiping the dragon or Satan. And Satan's man, the beast, the Antichrist, he has a deadly wound. But his deadly wound is healed. But if it's deadly, that means he died, right? He had a wound that killed him. A deadly wound means he died from the wound. But yet, if he comes back, then doesn't that sound like a resurrection? We'll look at that here a little bit more in a moment. But look at verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Hmm. Sounds like he's trying to be peaceable. But who is able to make war with him? Sounds like he's some sort of military commander. So is he really peaceable? Or does he want war? Well, you read in the Bible... He wants to kill people. And that's what he will attempt to do. Let's go ahead and read verse uh, 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to... Now look at this. Your new versions of the Bible change this word. This is why I'm King James only, because the words in the King James Bible are there for a reason, and I believe God gave us these words. Look at what he says. Power was given to him to continue... Forty and two months. Forty-two months is three and a half years. Continue means he was doing something before. So over here, he's the man of sin, but then he continues for forty-two months. So forty-two months is the man of sin, presumably, and then forty-two months is the son of perdition. 
and he continues. What happened that made the change from the man of sin to the son of perdition? A deadly wound. And he was wounded, and it looks like he literally died. And I don't know, I might be inserting this, but I don't know if it's too much to insert. What if he laid in the grave for three days and three nights? Hmm. Three days, three nights. Why would you say that, Robert Breaker? Well, the devil tries to imitate everything that God does. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day. He, he was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So I can see Satan imitating everything that Jesus does. Jesus shed his blood on the cross for our sins. I'm sure the Antichrist, when he dies, he'll probably say, Oh, I died for you, you know. And when he comes back to life, they'll worship him even more. Because they'll be like, no one can kill him. Oh, wow, he, he has power over death in the grave. No, it doesn't. Jesus did, though. What I see happening here, and this is me connecting the dots in the Bible, is that he's literally a man, but the man is killed, but the devil somehow is allowed to enter into the body of that man and use that body and live in that body for three and a half years. Now that's interesting. So what would he be? No wonder it's a capital W because he's the devil incarnate. He's literally the body of the Antichrist with the devil inside that body, using that body, and the devil has now got him a body to work with. Hmm. Let's continue reading there in Revelation chapter 13. Verse 6, And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwelt in heaven. Well, that sounds a little bit like what we saw, that the Antichrist is going to go in the temple and claim that he's God. Verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, people say, the saints, okay, so that's us, so we go through the tribulation. No. You see, there's church-age saints, and that's what is here. Church-age saints. And then there's what's called tribulation saints. And if you miss the rapture, then you can come to Jesus during the tribulation. But it's going to be way different. Because there's no other rapture for you to go up in. You're going to have to either find a place to live for seven years, where you have seven years worth of food and no one will bother you. Or you'll have to uh, endure to the end without dying, which I don't know how. It's going to be very hard because they'll be hunting you down. So how do you become a saint in the tribulation? Well, the Bible tells us in other passages here in the book of Revelation that you willingly die as a martyr for Jesus Christ. And it says beheaded. Their heads are chopped off. Those were beheaded, it says in the Bible. So it's different. Today we're saved by trusting in the blood that Jesus shed for us. If you miss the rapture and you're in the tribulation period, now you've got to shed your blood for Jesus by allowing them to chop your head off. And so you're going to be shedding your blood for Jesus. And the Bible says, And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded before the throne of God. So those are your tribulation saints. And I believe that's what it's talking about here. He will overcome the tribulation saints. That can't be the church because Jesus says the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. So the church has to be gone in order for the tribulation saints who now say, oh, now I believe in Jesus. Well, he overcomes them by chopping their heads off. Because we're about to read here that you either take his mark or you are killed by being beheaded. So it continues here in verse 8. And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. So that's the Lamb's book of life slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So they're killed with a sword. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. The dragon is Satan. They're speaking like a dragon. Hmm, could it be Satan incarnate inside of that beast? And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So if he's inhabiting the body, then they're worshiping that body, but they're really worshiping the dragon inside. 
and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. Now, by the way, before I read on, Zechariah chapter 11. Zechariah chapter 11 tells us what this wound will be like. Nothing like a Bible to clear things up. Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 17. Woe, it says, to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Now, I'm not a good artist, so I'll try. <laughs> but here's his right arm. He's going to have a right arm that's withered. And I don't know what that entails exactly, but somehow he's going to have a right arm that's not as good as his other arm. So does that mean it's cut, or does that mean it just doesn't work? But then his right eye will be withered. He'll have like a patch. And he'll have this patch over his right eye. So you want to know who the Antichrist is? Well, halfway through the tribulation, he's going to be the guy that somehow is killed with a sword, maybe a terrorist or something, attacks him and tries to kill him and damages his right arm and damages his right eye. So you want to look out, if you miss the rapture, you want to look out for who the Antichrist is. He's going to be that guy with a withered right eye and something wrong with his right arm. Now let's go back to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. Revelation 13, verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Nice guy, isn't he? This Antichrist, he's so nice. He's coming in with flattery. He's like, hey, I'm just a great person except me. Everyone's worshiping me. He's so great. No, he's not. He's mean as the devil. He's a murderer. He's a killer. It's my way or the highway, he'll say. And if you don't do what I say, then you die. And he kills people. That, that's not nice. He's coming in, oh, peace, 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 and safety, safety, and peace, peace, and security, peace, peace, peace. And all he wants is war. He has a split personality. He wants to kill people. And it says there, in verse 15, at the end, should be killed. If you don't worship, he's religious. And he wants you to worship what he says or die. Almost sounds like, I don't know, the Spanish Inquisition? <laughs> and it goes on there, verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads. So he's going to cause all these people to have a mark. And they're going to have to have a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So here's the right hand. This mark is going to be here or here. And what is that mark? Well, some people think it's going to be a quantum digital tattoo, perhaps, or something of that effect. And it says here in verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Three things. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. So the Antichrist number is going to be six, six, six. And that number is going to follow that guy everywhere he goes. And one of the ways you can figure out who this guy is is seeing that six, six, six everywhere. What about that? Six, six, six. So the Antichrist... He's going to rule someday. And he's trying to present himself as a peaceable, nice person, but he's really a warmonger. He's really a murderer. He really wants to kill. He's going to come and flatter everybody and try to say, look how nice I am, but he's really mean, and he's evil, and he's wicked. Let's go to Daniel chapter 8. So do you see the split personality there? Uh, basically, he's an actor pretending to be something he's not so people will accept him. Uh, well, doesn't that remind you of the people that killed Jesus? They were called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And Jesus would say, you hypocrites. Outwardly, you're like this, but inwardly, you're this. Well, the Antichrist outwardly appears to be peaceable and nice and caring and loving and oh. But inwardly, he's evil. And he wants to hurt. And he wants to take over and become a dictator and a slave driver and an evil enforcer of his wicked law. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. And look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 23, speaking about the Antichrist. 
Daniel 8, 23, In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, this is the latter time, so our time, this is the Antichrist, in understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So a fierce countenance. So he's fierce. He's not a nice fella. He's fierce. He's angry. So he's fierce. Oh, let's see if I spelled fierce right. I before he except after C. Okay. So he's fierce. And he understands dark sentences. What are dark sentences? Well, I don't know, to be honest with you. But there are some people out there that say that there are certain sentences that if you say forward, they can contain a hidden message backwards. So he's very well versed in knowing how to say certain things that if you backmask it, what's called backmasking, play it backwards, it says something very different. You know, like, yes, we can, yes, we can. You play that backwards. Thank you, Satan. And you're like, whoa, you know, I, I, you people say that. You can look that up on YouTube and see if that's real. But it makes me think of, huh, is there such a thing as dark sentences? In Satanism, they learn how to speak backwards and things like that. I had a tape many years ago of a rock group. I think it was Black Sabbath. And uh, the guy who's one of the drummers or something, one of the singers, begins to go, and start talking in a, in a weird thing. No one knew what they were saying. But then when you played it backwards, you could understand what he was saying. Same thing with uh, Stairway to Heaven. A lot of these secular music from Hollywood and other places, they contain hidden messages in backmasking. And boy, that's interesting if you backmask. A friend of mine, when we were younger, about 18, we got Stairway to Heaven on a cassette tape. We took the tape apart and put it all back together to where it would play backwards. And we played Stairway to Heaven backwards. And there were secret messages. And I tell you, it was creepy. It was creepy. I remember when it said, My sweet Satan! Just like that. When we were playing it backwards. And I went, whoa, I don't think I'll listen to these fellas anymore. Um, Pink Floyd, they say. You listen to Pink Floyd backwards. Um, you can hear distinctly in Pink Floyd backwards, Congratulations, you found the secret message. I mean, there's a lot of YouTube videos about all this and backmasking. Look into that. Is that what it's talking about when it's talking about dark sentences? But look what it says here in verse 24. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully. So he seeks to destroy. Well, doesn't the Bible tell you that? That that's what the devil wants to do? He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy? Because he is Satan incarnate, eventually. So he's working for the devil. And then the devil gets to work through him. And it says here, And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice... I thought that was interesting. Practice. Uh, people into magic, what do they do? They practice magic. And shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Well, who are the mighty and holy people? Jews. Israel. That would be over here when God goes back to dealing with the nation of Israel during the tribulation period. And uh, it says here, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper. Policy. Isn't that interesting? A lot of presidents in America, what's your policy? <laughs> I don't really like that term, policy. Uh, craft, that's interesting. I mean, craft, witchcraft, you know, to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Comes in peaceably in order to destroy. Sounds like to me a split personality. And um, he also shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Well, that's Jesus Christ at Armageddon. So while he's ruling during this time... He gets his time, but then Jesus Christ will destroy him. And we thank God for that, we who are saved. So the Antichrist is going to rule someday. And this is how I see it. As I read my Bible and I connect the dots, I clearly see the Antichrist coming in as the man of sin. And he's revealed. He's revealed, and we see who he is. And as soon as we understand, as soon as the body of Christ, those who are saved, realize, that's him, that's the Antichrist. Boom, we're out, so that he doesn't rule over us. And he rules for 42 months or three and a half years, and then he dies. Someone assassinates him. Then he rises again. I suspect three days, three nights, because he's going to try to imitate. You know, the devil imitates everything that Jesus does. But then he's going to come back on the scene and say, no, no, I wasn't really dead. Or he's going to say, yeah, I died, but I came back to life by a supernatural miracle. Or something like that. 
And that's when the devil is going to be inside of him, the son of perdition. And we read the verse over in Revelation. He shall continue for 42 months. So he's going to continue for three and a half years. So let's go ahead and turn over to Revelation, if you would, Revelation. But he's going to rule for that last time. And it's all in the Bible, and it's all there, and you can all see it, you know, if you just, if you just look for it. And a lot of people, they don't, they don't read their Bible. But let's go to Revelation real quick. Revelation chapter 13. And in Revelation chapter 13, we read all of chapter 13, so I won't go back and read that again. But do remember verse 5, for 42 months, he continues for 42 months. Matter of fact, let's go over to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and an angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. <laughs> so, forty-two months they have the temple of the Jews. You know what that means to me? There must be a rebuilt temple in Israel. And that temple must be rebuilt, and it could, it could start now, before the rapture, or right after the rapture. But it has to be rebuilt so that those Jews will be in this time period worshiping in their temple. You know, there's some people out there claim to be Christians. No, God's done with the Jews. There's no rebuilt temple. Then what did we just read in 2 Thessalonians? <laughs> Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians. You mean that's a lie? But in 2 Thessalonians, what does it say about the Antichrist? It says that he opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Now, verse 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. When is that going to take place? Clearly, that's going to take place here in this time period, the last three and a half years. So somewhere around this time period, the devil sits in the temple. Now, how could he do that if it's not rebuilt? So there must be a rebuilt temple in Israel. There must be the Jewish temple rebuilt. And, you know, they're all wanting to rebuild it. So it must be true. And I'm speaking to people right now that in your lifetime, you're going to see that Jewish temple rebuilt. Isn't that amazing? Another interesting thing that takes place here in chapter 11 is the two witnesses. Verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, and on and on. That's interesting. The Bible's very, very, very detailed and exact, and it gives us 1,260 days. 1,260 days is exactly three and a half years or 42 months. And these two witnesses, what happens to them? Well, the same thing happens to them that happens to the Antichrist. It appears that they're killed. Look at verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that is sent out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. And look what happens to them. Verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and they shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And verse 12, what happens? Come up hither, and they ascend up to heaven in a cloud. So the same time period that those two witnesses are doing their thing, it sounds like the Antichrist is doing his thing. And when they're done with their testimony after three and a half years, they are killed. But then after three and a half days, they rise again. Excellent time for the Antichrist to also be killed as well. And the same time, same happens to him, then he comes back with Satan incarnate. So when I read my Bible, that's how I connect the dots. That's what I see taking place. So the Antichrist sits in the temple. When the Antichrist goes in, and that would be the son of perdition here, when he goes into the rebuilt temple and sits in it, he says, I am God. Worship me as God. And we see this. This is what the Bible calls 
the abomination of desolation. Go to Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is speaking to Jews and warning them about this time. Matthew 24, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So there will be a time when the Jews in Israel will see their temple desecrated by the Antichrist figure going in and sitting down and saying, I am God. And Jesus says, when you see that, if you're a Jew, you need to flee into the mountains of Judea. And we'll read about that in Revelation chapter 12 here in a second. But then let's read a little farther. Verse 17, Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. All right. That means that the last three and a half years, this last three and a half years, that's called the Great Tribulation. So we call the seven years tribulation, or the tribulation, but the last three and a half years we call the Great Tribulation. And that will be the time when God's wrath is poured out in the book of Revelation upon the earth. And that is the time when the devil, or the Antichrist, is doing his best to kill the children of Israel. That's why they're having to flee here into the mountains. Verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, that's Israel, those days shall be shortened. And let's read all the way down there to verse 29. Verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. The Antichrist is the Antichrist. Do you ever think that he's going to show up and say, I am the true Christ? Because the Jews rejected the true Christ, Jesus, and they're still looking for their Christ today. So many Jews are going to be deceived into thinking, when this fellow shows up, he's so nice, he's so peaceable, why well, he must be the true Messiah. They're going to choose and back the wrong horse, and they're going to have a false Messiah. And then it's going to eventually become clear to them, whoops, we chose the false Christ. We should have chosen the true Christ. Verse 25, Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. That is Armageddon. And at the Battle of Armageddon, if you read your Bible, we see that at the end of the battle, all these people that were the enemies of Jesus lie dead, and the eagles come, and the birds come, and eat their carcasses. So clearly this is a passage of the tribulation and talking about that. Look at verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. That's Armageddon. Jesus coming with great power and great glory. So you have to have the tribulation before Armageddon. And you have to have the rapture before the tribulation. Because the tribulation is three and a half years and three and a half years. Seven years total. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12 quickly. So much scripture here, but I want you to understand and see it all. Revelation chapter 12. I'll skip down to verse 5. And she brought forth the man-child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now that would be Jesus Christ. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Now the woman would have to be Israel, where she had a place prepared of God, and they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. So 1,260 days. So you're seeing Israel fleeing and for 1,260 days being protected by God as the Antichrist tries to kill those people who were of Israel who escaped. How did the Antichrist try to kill them? I find it very interesting. Let's skip down to verse 13 and see how the Antichrist tries to kill them, but also see what else it says. 
Revelation 12, 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time. A time, that'd be one. Times, that's at least two, so that would be three and a half. Sounds exactly like three and a half years, which is 1,206. So the last half of the tribulation, that three and a half years, God is saving Israel and allowing them all to flee into the wilderness where God protects them from the Antichrist. Look what the Antichrist is trying to do. He's actually called the son of perdition. Verse 15, And the serpent shall cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And it continues there. Let's go over to Daniel chapter 9. Because this has already been prophesied in Daniel chapter 9 to Israel. And watch what it says in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. Daniel 9, 26, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. Well, that's Revelation 12. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And it continues there, verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abomination she shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. But isn't that interesting? It's talking about the true Messiah, and it's talking about the Antichrist using a flood to try to destroy the children of Israel. God's not done with the Jews. He's going to protect them. I was going to go to Romans chapter 11 and read verse 1 through 28, but I don't, I don't have time to read the entire thing. But go to Romans chapter 11. There are a lot of people out there today who claim to be Christians who are apostates, who have fallen into apostasy and are turning away from this teaching. They don't believe in a pre trib rapture. They don't believe that God is going to deal with Israel anymore. And many of them uh, do not believe that Israel is going to rebuild a temple and that the tribulation is not for the Jews. But yet you read your Bible and you go, no, it's, it's for the Jews. So God's not done with Israel. He's going back to dealing with the nation of Israel once again. And that's what Romans chapter 11 talks about. Romans chapter 11. Again, don't have time to read the whole thing, but look what it says in verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. When? Well, look at verse 25. The end of the verse says, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So the Gentiles get the world. Matter of fact, one man, a Gentile, takes over the whole world. Maybe half Gentile, half Jew. I don't know. Maybe that's why the Jews accept him. But this Antichrist fella, he gets it. At the time of the Gentiles ends at Armageddon. Now it's the time when Jesus comes and rules on this earth for a thousand years. And he's going to rule and reign and all Israel shall be saved as a nation. Now let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I need you to know this because there are people out there that claim to be Christians that preach the opposite. Do they even read their Bibles? It's all right here. Luke chapter 1 and verse 31, talking about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Luke 1 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever. Amen. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And that's what we call the millennial kingdom of Christ. This is when Jesus comes back at Armageddon and takes over the world. And now he rules for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 19 talks about when Jesus returns. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19 starting there verse 11. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. That's right here at the Battle of Armageddon. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, capital W. We know that's Jesus. And the armies which were in heaven, well that would be us who were saved, that go up at the rapture, we come back down with him. And the armies which were in heaven followed him 
upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And look what it says there. Read the rest of it. I don't have time, but look at that. You've got the eagles coming. And you've got the birds coming to eat. And the birds get to, get to feast on the enemies of Jesus Christ. Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah chapter 3. What we are seeing now in the world is a United Nations takeover. And the United Nations goal is to take over all nations and bring in a one world government in which one man rules the world. Well, did you know that was prophesied of in the Bible? <laughs> it's right here in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 8. And here's what the Bible says. They get it, but then God defeats the United Nations. God defeats the Antichrist who took over using the United Nations, and God rules it all. And they, the United Nations, are destroyed. Zechariah chapter 3, or Zephaniah, I'm in Zechariah, how did I get over there? Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, P-R-E-Y, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation. Right here at Armageddon. Even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. One day Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming first at the rapture. He's going to take everyone who's saved up with him. Then there's going to be seven years on this earth and it's going to be bad called the tribulation period. And this man who's going to come in all nice and peaceable is going to turn into a fierce, mean, hateful person who tries to destroy anyone who goes against him. And he will even try to kill the Jews. But thank God Jesus Christ is only going to let him have his seven years. And Jesus Christ is going to defeat him. So let me close this with this. Are you saved? Are you going at the rapture? If not, come today to Jesus Christ for salvation. Salvation is only found through the blood that he shed on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. It's what Jesus did that saves you, not what you do. And if you're a saved person, then you can go at the rapture and escape this awful time known as the tribulation. So are you saved? Well, I hope so. If not, get saved. See my other videos on how to be saved. I hope that's a blessing. God bless you. And I hope this uh, opened your eyes to what the Bible says is going to happen in the last days. And we're already starting to see it. We're already starting to see it. This war in Russia. It's all coming to pass and all leading up to the war of Gog and Magog and all these things. So get in your Bible because this is the newspaper written before it happens. <laughs> this is more than the daily news. This is future news. And you can know it if you read your Bible. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.